Section 1 of The Hungry Stones and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Ziegler The Hungry Stones and Other Stories by Rabindranath Tagore Translated by C. F. Andrews The Hungry Stones my kinsman and myself were returning to Calcutta from our Punjab trip when we met the man in a train. From his dress and bearing we took him at first to be an up-country Mahomedan, but we were puzzled as we heard him talk. He discoursed upon all subjects so confidently that you might think the disposer of all things consulted him at all times in all he did. Hitherto we had been perfectly happy as we did not know the secret and unheard-of forces were at work that the Russians had advanced close to us, that the English had deep and secret policies, that confusion among the native chiefs had come to a head. But our newly acquired friend said with a sly smile, There happen more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are reported in your newspapers. As we had never stirred out of our homes before, the demeanor of the man struck us dumb with wonder. Be the topic ever so trivial, he would quote science or comment on the Vedas, or repeat quatrains from some Persian poet. And as we had no pretense to a knowledge of science or the Vedas or Persian, our admiration for him went on increasing, and my kinsman, a theosophist, was firmly convinced that our fellow passenger must have been supernaturally inspired by some strange magnetism or occult power, by an astral body or something of that kind. He listened to the trite saying that fell from the lips of our extraordinary companion with devotional rapture, and secretly took down notes of his conversation. I fancy that the extraordinary man saw this, and was a little pleased with it. When the train reached the junction, we assembled in the waiting room for the connection. It was then 10 p.m., and as the train, we heard, was likely to be very late, owing to something wrong in the lines. I spread my bed on the table and was about to lie down for a comfortable doze when the extraordinary person deliberately set about spinning the following yarn. Of course I could get no sleep that night. When owing to a disagreement about some questions of administrative policy, I threw up my post at Junagar and entered the service of the Nisam of Hadria. They appointed me at once, as a strong young man, collector of cotton duties at Barak. Bark is a lovely place. The Susta chatters over stony ways and babbles on the pebbles, tripping like a skillful dancing girl in through the woods below the lonely hills. A flight of 150 steps rises from the river, and above that flight, on the river's brim and at the foot of the hills, there stands a solitary marble palace. Around it there is no habitation of man, the village and cart mart of Bark being far off. About 250 years ago, the Emperor Mahmud Shah II had built this lonely palace for his pleasure and luxury. In his days, jets of rose water spurted from its fountains, and on the cold marble floors of its spray-cooled rooms, young Persian damsels would sit, their hair disheveled before bathing, and splashing their soft naked feet in the clear water of the reservoirs, would sing to the tune of the guitar, the ghazals of their vineyards. The fountains play no longer, the songs have ceased. No longer do the snow-white feet step gracefully on the snowy marble. It is but the vast and solitary quarters of cess collectors like us, men oppressed with solitude and deprived of the society of women. Now, Karim Khan, the old clerk of my office, warned me repeatedly not to take up my abode there. Pass the day there, if you like, said he, but never stay the night. I passed it off with a light laugh. The servants said that they would work till dark and go away at night. I gave my ready assent. The house had such a bad name that even thieves would not venture near it after dark. At first the solitude of the deserted palace weighed upon me like a nightmare. I would stay out and work hard as long as possible, then return home at night jaded and tired, go to bed and fall asleep. Before a week had passed, the palace began to exert a weird fascination upon me. It is difficult to describe or to induce people to believe, 
but I felt as if the whole house was like a living organism, slowly and imperceptibly digesting me by the action of some stupefying gastric juice. Perhaps the process had begun as soon as I set my foot in the house, but I distinctly remember the day on which I first was conscious of it. It was the beginning of summer, and the market being dull, I had no work to do. A little before sunset I was sitting in an armchair near the water's edge below the steps. The susta had shrunk and sunk low. A broad patch of sand on the other side glowed with the hues of evening. On this side the pebbles, at the bottom of the clear shallow waters, were glistening. There was not a breath of wind anywhere, and the still air was laden with an oppressive scent from the spicy shrubs growing on the hills close by. As the sun sank behind the hilltops, a long dark curtain fell upon the stage of day, and the intervening hills cut short the time in which the light and shade mingle at sunset. I thought of going out for a ride, and was about to get up when I heard a footfall on the steps behind. I looked back, but there was no one. As I sat down again, thinking to be an illusion, I heard many footfalls, as if a large number of persons were rushing down the steps. A strange thrill of delight, slightly tinged with fear, passed through my frame, and though there was not a figure before my eyes, methought I saw a bevy of joyous maidens coming down the steps to bathe in the Susta in that summer evening. Not a sound was in the valley, in the river, or in the palace, to break the silence. But I distinctly heard the maiden's gray and mirthful laugh, like the gurgle of a spring gushing forth in a hundred cascades as they ran past me, in quick, playful pursuit of each other, towards the river without noticing me at all. As they were invisible to me, so I was, as it were, invisible to them. The river was perfectly calm, but I felt that its still, shallow, and clear waters were stirred suddenly by the splash of many an arm jingling with bracelets, that the girls laughed and dashed and spattered water at one another, that the feet of the fair swimmers tossed the tiny waves up in showers of pearl. I felt a thrill at my heart. I cannot say whether the excitement was due to fear or delight or curiosity. I had a strong desire to see them more clearly but not was visible before me. I thought I could catch all that they said, if only I strained my ears. But however hard I strained them, I heard nothing but the chirping of the cicadas in the woods. It seemed as if a dark curtain of two hundred and fifty years was hanging before me, and I would fain lift a corner of it tremblingly and peer through, though the assembly on the other side was completely enveloped in darkness. The oppressive closeness of the evening was broken by a sudden gust of wind, and the still surface of the soista rippled and curled like the hair of a nymph, and from the woods wrapped in the evening gloom there came forth a simultaneous murmur, as though they were awakening from a black dream. Call it reality or dream. The momentary glimpse of that invisible mirage reflected from a far-off world, two hundred and fifty years old, vanished in a flash. The mystic forms that brushed past me in their quick unbodied steps and loud voiceless laughter and threw themselves into the river did not go back wringing their dripping robes as they went. Like fragrance wafted away by the wind they were dispersed by a single breath of the spring. Then I was filled with a lively fear that it was the muse that had taken advantage of my solitude and possessed me. The witch had evidently come to ruin a poor devil like myself making a living by collecting cotton duties. I decided to have a good dinner. It is the empty stomach that all sorts of incurable diseases find an easy prey. I sent for my cook and gave orders for a rich, sumptuous, moglay dinner, redolent with spices and ghee. Next morning the whole affair appeared a queer fantasy. With a light heart I put on a sola hat like the sahibs, and drove out to my work. I was to have written my quarterly report that day, and expected to return late, but before it was dark I was strangely drawn to my house. By what I could not say. I felt they were all waiting, and that I should delay no longer. Leaving my report unfinished, I rose, put on my sola hat, and startling the dark, shady, desolate path with the rattle of my carriage, I reached the vast silent palace, standing on the gloomy skirts of the hills. 
On the first floor, the stairs led to a very spacious hall, its roof stretching wide over ornamental arches resting on three rows of massive pillars, and groaning day and night under the weight of its own intense solitude. The day had just closed, and the lamps had not yet been lighted. As I pushed the door open, a great bustle seemed to follow within, as if a throng of people had broken up in confusion, and rushed out through the doors and windows and corridors and verandas and rooms to make its hurried escape. As I saw no one, I stood bewildered, my hair on end in a kind of ecstatic delight. A faint scent of attar and unguents, almost affected by age, lingered in my nostrils. Standing in the darkness of that vast desolate hall, between the rows of those ancient pillars, I could hear the gurgle of fountains splashing on the marble floor, a strange tune on the guitar, the jingle of ornaments and the tinkle of anklets, the clang of bells tolling the hours, the distant note of Nahabat, the din of the crystal pendants of chandeliers shaken by the breeze, the song of bulbuls from the cages in the corridors, the cackle of storks in the garden. All creating round me a strange, unearthly music. Then I came under such a spell that this intangible, inaccessible, unearthly vision appeared to be the only reality in the world, and all else a mere dream. That I, that is to say, Srijut so and so, the eldest son of so and so, of blessed memory, should be drawing a monthly salary of four hundred and fifty rupees by the discharge of my duties as a collector of cotton duties. And driving my dog cart to my office every day in a short coat and solar hat, appeared to me to be such an astonishingly ludicrous illusion that I burst into a hoarse laugh as I stood in the gloom of that vast silent hall. At that moment, my servant entered with a lighted kerosene lamp in his hand. I do not know whether he thought me mad, but it came back to me at once that I was in very deed Srijut so and so, son of so and so, of blessed memory. And that, while our poets, great and small, alone could say whether inside or outside the earth, there was a region where unseen fountains perpetually played, and fairy guitars struck by invisible fingers, set forth an eternal harmony. This, at any rate, was certain that I collected duties at the cotton market at Branch and earned thereby four hundred and fifty rupees per mensum as my salary. I laughed in great glee at my curious illusion as I sat over the newspaper at my camp table, lighted by the kerosene lamp. After I had finished my paper and eaten my moglai dinner, I put out the lamp and lay down on my bed in a small side room. Through the open window, a radiant star, high above the Avali hills, skirted by the darkness of their woods, was gazing intently from millions and millions of miles away in the sky at Mister Collector, lying on a humble camp bedstead. I wondered and felt amused at the idea, and do not know when I fell asleep or how long I slept. But suddenly I awoke with a start, though I heard no sound and saw no intruder. Only the steady bright star on the hill top had set, and the dim light of the new moon was stealthily entering the room through the open window, as if ashamed of its intrusion. I saw nobody, but felt as if some one was gently pushing me. As I awoke, she said not a word, but beckoned me with her five fingers bedecked with rings to follow her cautiously. I got up noiselessly, and though not a soul save myself was there in the countless apartments of that deserted palace, with its slumbering sounds and waiting echoes, I feared that every step lest any one should wake up. Most of the rooms of the palace were always kept closed, and I never entered them. I followed breathless and with silent steps my invisible guide. I cannot now say where. What endless dark and narrow passages! What long corridors! What silent and solemn audience! Chambers and closed secret cells I crossed. Though I could not see my fair guide, her form was not visible to my mind's eye. An Arab girl, her arms hard and smooth as marble, visible through her loose sleeves, a thin veil falling on her face from the fringe of her cap, and a curved dagger at her waist. Methought that one of the thousand and one Arabian Nights had been wafted to me from the world of romance, and that at the dead of night I was wending my way through the dark narrow alleys of slumbering Baghdad to a trysting place fraught with peril. 
At last my fair guide stopped abruptly before a deep blue screen and seemed to point to something below. There was nothing there, but a sudden dread froze the blood in my heart. Methought I saw there on the floor at the foot of the screen a terrible negro eunuch dressed in rich brocade, sitting and dozing with outstretched legs, with a naked sword on his lap. My fair guide lightly tripped over his legs and held up a fringe of the screen. I could catch a glimpse of a part of the room spread with Persian carpet. Someone was sitting inside on a bed. I could not see her, but only caught a glimpse of two exquisite feet in gold embroidered slippers, hanging out from those loose saffron-colored pajamas and placed idly on the orange-colored velvet carpet. On one side there was a bluish crystal tray on which a few apples, pears, oranges, and bunches of grapes in plenty, two small cups and a gold-tinted decanter were evidently waiting the guest a fragrant intoxicating vapor issuing from a sort of incense that burned within almost overpowered my senses as with trembling heart i made an attempt to step across the outstretched legs of the eunuch he woke up suddenly with a start and the sword fell from his lap with a sharp clang on the marble floor a terrific scream made me jump and i saw i was sitting on that camp bedstead of mine sweating heavily and the crescent moon looked pale in the morning light, like a weary sleepless patient at dawn, and our crazy Meher Ali was crying out, as is his daily custom, Stand back, stand back, while he went along the lonely road. Such was the abrupt close of one of my Arabian nights, but there were yet a thousand nights left. Then followed a great discord between my days and nights. During the day I would go to my work worn and tired, cursing the bewitching light and her empty dreams. But as night came, my daily life with its bonds and shackles of work would appear a petty, false, ludicrous vanity. After nightfall I was caught and overwhelmed in the snare of a strange intoxication. I would then be transformed into some unknown personage of bygone age, playing my part in an unwritten history, and my short English coat and tight breeches did not suit me in the least. With a red velvet cap on my head, loose pajamas, an embroidered vest, a long flowing silk gown, and colored handkerchiefs scented with attar, I would complete my elaborate toilet, sit on a high cushioned chair, and replace my cigarette with a many coiled nargile filled with rose water, as if in eager expectation of a strange meeting with the beloved one. I have no power to describe the marvelous incidents that unfolded themselves as the gloom of night deepened. I felt as if in the curious apartments of that vast edifice the fragments of a beautiful story, which I could follow for some distance, but of which I could never see the end, flew about in a sudden gust of the vernal breeze, and all the same I would wander from room to room in pursuit of them the whole night long. Amid the eddy of these dream fragments, amid the smell of henna and the twanging of the guitar, amid the waves of air charged with fragrant spray, I would catch a flash of lightning, the momentary glimpse of a fair damsel. It was she who had saffron-colored pajamas, white ruddy soft feet in gold embroidery slippered with curved toes, a close-fitting bodice wrought with gold, a red cap from which a golden frill fell on her snowy brow and cheeks. She had maddened me, in pursuit of her I wandered from room to room, from path to path, among the bewildering maze of alleys in the enchanted dreamland of the nether world of sleep. Sometimes in the evening, while arraying myself carefully as a prince of the blood royal before a large mirror, with a candle burning on either side, I would see the sudden reflection of the Persian beauty by the side of my own. A swift turn of her neck, a quick, eager glance of intense passion and pain glowing in her large, dark eyes, just a suspicion of speech on her dainty red lips, her figure, fair and slim, crowned with youth like a blossoming creeper, quickly uplifted in her graceful, tilting gait, a dazzling flash of pain and craving and ecstasy, a smile and a glance and a blaze of jewels and silk, and she melted away. A wild glist of wind, laden with all the fragrance of hills and woods, would only put out my light, and I would fling aside my dress and lie down on my bed, my eyes closed and my body thrilling with delight. 
and there around me in the breeze, amid all the perfume of the woods and hills, floated through the silent gloom many a caress and many a kiss, and many a tender touch of hands, and gentle murmurs in my ears, and fragrant breaths on my brow, or a sweetly perfumed kerchief was wafted again and again on my cheeks. Then slowly a mysterious serpent would twist her stupefying coils about me, and heaving a heavy sigh, I would lapse into insensibility, and then into a profound slumber. One evening I decided to go out on my horse. I do not know who implored me to stay, but I would listen to no entreaties that day. My English hat and coat were resting on a rack, and I was about to take them down when a sudden whirlwind crested with the sands of the Susta, and the dead leaves of the Avali Hills caught them up and whirled them round and round, while a loud peal of merry laughter rose higher and higher, striking all the chords of mirth till it died away in the land of sunset. I could not go out for my ride, and the next day I gave up my queer English coat and hat for good. That day, again, at dead of night, I heard the stifled heartbreaking sobs of someone, as if below the bed, below the floor, below the stony foundation of that gigantic palace. From the depths of a dark, damp grave, a voice piteously cried and implored me, O oh, rescue me, break through these doors of hard illusion, death-like slumber and fruitless dreams. Place by your side on the saddle, press me to your heart, and riding through the hills and woods and across the river, take me to the warm radiance of your sunny rooms above. Who am I? How can I rescue thee? What drowning beauty, what incarnate passion shall I drag to the shore from this wild eddy of dreams? O lovely ethereal apparition, where didst thou flourish and when? By what cool spring under the shade of what date groves wast thou born in the lap of what homeless wanderer in the desert? What Bedouin snatched thee from thy mother's arms, an opening bud plucked from a wild creeper, placed thee on a horse swift as lightning? crossed the burning sands, and took thee to the slave market of what royal city? And there, what officer of the Bacha, seeing the glory of thy bashful blossoming youth, paid for thee in gold, placed thee in a golden palanquin, and offered thee as a present for the seraglio of his master? And, oh, the history of that place, the music of the serang, the jingle of anklets, the occasional flash of daggers, and the glowing wine of Shirat's poison! and the piercing, flashing glance. What infinite grandeur! What endless servitude! The slave girls to thy right and left waved the shamar as diamonds flashed from their bracelets. The Bachah, the king of kings, fell on his knees at thy snowy feet in bejeweled shoes, and outside trembled the Abyssinian eunuch, looking like a messenger of death, but clothed like an angel, stood with a naked sword in his hand, then, oh, flower of the desert, swept away by the blood-stained, dazzling ocean of grandeur, with its foam of jealousy, its rocks and shoals of intrigue, on what shore of cruel death wast thou cast, or in what other land more splendid and more cruel? Suddenly, at this moment, that crazy Meher Ali screamed out, Stand back, stand back, all is false, all is false. I opened my eyes and saw that it was already light, my chaprazi came and handed me my letters, and the cook waited with a salam for my orders. I said, No, I can stay here no longer. That very day I packed up and moved to my office. Old Karim Khan smiled a little when he saw me. I felt nettled, but said nothing, and fell to my work. As evening approached, I grew absent-minded. I felt as if I had an appointment to keep, and the work of examining the cotton account seemed wholly useless. Even the Nizamat of Nizam did not appear to be of much worth. Whatever belonged to the present, whatever was moving and acting and working for bread seemed trivial, meaningless, contemptible. I threw my pen down, closed my ledgers, got into my dog-cart, and drove away. I noticed that it stopped of itself at the gate of the marble palace just at the hour of twilight. With quick steps I climbed the stairs and entered the room. A heavy silence was reigning within. The dark rooms were looking sullen as if they'd taken offense. My heart was full of contrition, but there was no one to whom I could lay it bare, or of whom I could ask forgiveness. I wandered about the dark rooms with vacant mind, 
I wished I had a guitar to which I could sing to the unknown. O、oh, fire, the poor moth that made a vain effort to fly away has come back to thee. Forgive it but this once, burn its wings and consume it in thy flame. Suddenly two teardrops fell from overhead on my brow. Dark masses of clouds overcast the top of the Avalli hills that day. The gloomy woods and the sooty waters of the Susta were waiting in terrible suspense and in ominous calm. Suddenly land, water, and sky shivered, and a wild tempest blast rushed howling through the distant pathless woods, showing its lightning teeth like a raving maniac who had broken his chains. The desolate halls of the palace banged their doors and moaned in the bitterness of anguish. The servants were all in the office, and there was no one to light the lamps. The night was cloudy and moonless. In the dense gloom within, I could distinctly feel that a woman was lying on her face on the carpet below the bed, clasping and tearing her long dishevelled hair with desperate fingers. Blood was trickling down her fair brow. And she was now laughing a hard, harsh, mirthless laugh. Now bursting into violent, ringing sobs. Now rending her bodice and striking at her bare bosom, as the wind roared through the open window and the rain poured in torrents and soaked her through and through. All night there was no cessation of the storm or of the passionate cry. I wandered from room to room in the dark with unveiling sorrow. Whom could I counsel when no one was by? Whose was this intense agony of sorrow? Whence arose this inconsolable grief? And the madman cried out, "Stand back! Stand back! All is false! All is false!" I saw that the day had dawned, and Meher Ali was going round and round the palace with his usual cry in that dreadful weather. Suddenly it came to me that perhaps he also had lived once in that house, and that though he had gone mad. He came there every day and went round and round, fascinated by the weird spell cast by the marble demon. Despite the storm and rain, I ran to him and asked, "Ho, Merali, what is false?" The man answered nothing, but pushing me aside, went round and round with his frantic cry, like a bird flying fascinated about the jaws of a snake, and made a desperate effort to warn himself by repeating, "Stand back, stand back! All is false! All is false!" I ran like a madman through the pelting rain to my office and asked Karim Khan, "Tell me the meaning of all this." What I gathered from that old man was this: that at one time countless unrequited passions and unsatisfied longings and lurid flames of wild blazing pleasure raged within the palace, and that the curse of all the heartaches and blasted hopes had made its every stone thirsty and hungry. Eager to swallow up like a famished ogress any living man who might chance to approach, not one of those who lived there for three consecutive nights could escape these cruel jaws, save Meher Ali, who had escaped at the cost of his reason. I asked, "Is there no means whatever of my release?" The old man said, "There is only one means, and it is very difficult." I will tell you what it is, but first you must hear the history of a young Persian girl who once lived in that pleasure dome. A stranger or a more bitter heart-rending tragedy was never enacted on this earth. Just at that moment, the coolies announced that the train was coming. So soon, we hurriedly picked up our luggage as the tram steamed in. An English gentleman, apparently just aroused from slumber, was looking out of a first-class carriage, endeavoring to read the name of the station. As soon as he caught sight of our fellow passenger, he cried "Hallo!" and took him into his own compartment. As we got into a second-class carriage, we had no chance of finding out who the man was, nor what was the end of the story. I said, "The man evidently took us for fools and imposed upon us out of fun." The story is pure fabrication from start to finish. The discussion that followed ended in a lifelong rupture between my theosophist kinsman and myself. End of section one. Recording by Kirk Ziegler, Ogden, Utah. Voiceovers by Kirk dot com.